Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Mark Karlansky, author of The Core of an Onion, Peeling the Rarest Common Food, featuring more than 100 historical recipes. It's published by Bloomsbury, and it was released earlier this month. If I listed all of Mark's books, we'd be here for quite a while. So a few that are reminiscent of this work are Salmon, Milk, The Big Oyster, Cod. But he's also written books about paper, fly fishing, and uh, 1968, the year that rocked the world, which it certainly did for me, um, because we're both of a certain age. so onions, you know, actually giving that brief bibliography of food, we buy it, we prepare it, we eat it, and then we clean up after it. But do we really ever, I don't know, deconstruct it like a tree? I mean, I'm looking at my, out my window at the trees. I'm admiring its beauty, perhaps its texture, if I'm there, fragrance. But simply put, what exactly is that tree? What's the experience of that? So that's what it is with many of the staples that Mark writes of, and then we don't often think of salt or cod or even paper or uh, Henry Pertowski's book, uh, The Pencil. Um, but then Julia Child says, as Mark quotes, and so do all the reviews, it's hard to imagine a civilization without onions. And I can just hear her saying that. Yes. And <laughs> I wrote down, I was in an elevator with her in San Francisco, with her and Jacques Pepin. And I just adopted Samantha from China. She was uh, just two years old. And on the way down, she was chatting to her and all. And then when we got out of the elevator, we were going to her limo. And she said, would you like to go to dinner with us? And I said, yes. And she goes, not you, your daughter. (laughs) I was also writing down at the same time with Elvira, if you remember her. Um, (laughs) But enough about me. Um, So (laughs) where is this elevator? So as I read the book, I realized, okay, the allium is not only a food, but it's a lovely flowering plant. It's ornamental. The root, the root, no pun intended, allium means to avoid. And I realized too that I am, your new word, a sepophile, one who loves onions, but but for the one thing that everyone knows about onions, the tears. So in any event, while onions may be ubiquitous and full of hitting messages, peeling away those layers, another pun, of meaning, custom, and usage is what Mark does so well. So welcome, Mark. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Hey, so as I said at the outset, and this is what everyone wants to hear, let's talk about crying. I mean, I have lots to cry about, but let's just limit it to the onion and why it makes you cry and how you can stop it and how some of the ways are silly. Right. Well, you know, the reason I did this book is is that although onions are very common, commonplace, they're everywhere. They're anything but ordinary. They're just really extraordinary. And one of the things that's extraordinary is that it's a vegetable with a defense mechanism. If you mess with an onion, it's going to spit sulfuric acid in your eye. And, uh, you know, this is designed to keep mammals from disturbing onions. So if you have a garden, You know, if you have a vegetable garden and all the rabbits will go in, they'll eat all your vegetables, but they won't touch the onions because they know we humans are the only mammals who are willing to endure the pain (laughs) to get the onion. Uh, What happens is if you uh, harm an onion, it releases a gas, a sulfuric gas that seeks water. And when it mixes with water, as in the moisture in your eyes, it turns into sulfuric acid and that hurts. Well, so you talk about, you know, there's a whole bunch of, I remember some of them, using a sharp knife, chopping it while you're next to running water, holding a piece of bread between your teeth, which you kind of poo-pooed, then- That doesn't work. And the wooden spoon doesn't work either. Uh, The running water does have a little science to it because as as I say, um, this gas seeks uh, it seeks water, 
seeks the water in your eyes. But if you're next to running water, it will go for that also. It won't completely divert away from your eyes, but a lot of it will go towards the water. So running water does uh, reduce the pain. One thing that you seldom hear suggested, and I don't know why not, uh, is to just wear glasses. Uh, it won't completely protect you because it can get to your eyes through your nose, but it will uh, protect you to a certain degree. And there is something called onion goggles. You can get onion goggles. Uh, some chefs use onion goggles, but you know, I mean, chefs these days really are into being cool and you don't look cool when you wear onion goggles. No, it's no pain, no gain. Yeah, I, there's some kind of masochistic aspect of it to me. I kind of like the idea of it because you're getting, you're going to eventually get pleasure from this pain. Well, yeah, you know, there's there there are scientists working on developing a, a painless onion. And I, I'm not at all excited about this because I think this goes into the same field as decaffeinated coffee, mock beer, you know, you gotta, uh, you gotta take the whole package. Why in God's name does anyone drink decaffeinated coffee? Is this basically brown water? I, I, I don't know. If you're not going to have caffeine, why have coffee? Yeah, or if you're not going to have alcohol, why drink beer? Yeah, you're not drinking it for the taste. Right. You know, especially if you're drinking Bud Light or <laughs> Bud right. Alcoholic, uh, however you feel about their policies. Um, well, so, okay. Two things people think about onions and then they kind of go away from it. The second one is what I alluded to, well, like John Lennon, the glass onion, is this idea of the metaphor, um, you know, and a process in which you uncover or understand something layer by layer by layer. And it's so inextricably tied to the onion. Yeah, but Egyptians were fascinated with that. They, they felt that the structure of the onion was like the structure of the universe. And they saw an onion as a symbol of eternal life. This idea of layer after layer. Uh, <clears throat> to me, the thing about uh, peeling onions is that there's no surprise inside. You just peel away. There's no pit in there. There's, you get nothing. <laughs> but, you know, what was... I'll, I jump around. I tend to jump around, but that just made me think of something. I got to write... I, I have to write stuff down because I'll forget it. Um, that made me think of the the recipe chapters about stuffed onions because i really never thought about them but they all sounded delicious especially yeah. the ones with the meat in them so you would get a, a special like tootsie roll pop treat there right right you know uh, a lot of cultures have uh uh stuffed onions Hung hungarian stuffed onions that was the one i liked yeah, awesome. yeah. That's, that's okay Oh, yeah. So before we go any further, because I'm a bookseller and you want to sell this book, that's the only reason you're talking to me, um, <laughs> is that uh, uh, there's tons of great illustrations. The recipes are beautifully written. And that leads to, and you, you need to hold this up. I don't have the book here. I just have the PDF. Hold up the cover of the book so we can sell the book if you have it there. Uh, I, I have the, the galley of the book here. Okay. So the reason I like that cover so much is the illustration of the onion is really nice. And the lettering does remind you of a, a, an elderly woman writing a recipe, right? Yeah. And it, it, what I liked about that was that it had a kind of a casualness to it that fit the tone of the book. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that's casualness may be saying too little about what it is. It's casual in the sense that it's informality. Yeah. And you're like you're sitting down with you, which I am talking about it and especially the way you lead into the recipes and then also i mean i didn't think i would be listening to or thinking about or reading about Pliny the elder and then thinking oh okay see that's you write books and then you start then i had to leave the book and start go to wikipedia and go back and think okay did he really i, I don't know did he die at vesuvius did he die in pompeii or not because you have your yeah. own questions about that so let's talk about Pliny the Elder then. Well, uh, according to the record, he did die at Pompeii. That he he went after Vesuvius erupted. Uh, he had friends there, and he went to rescue them, and he got killed in the process. Um, and how do I know? How do you? How do we find this stuff out? How do we know he's corpulent? You know. Where well, 
you know, the, the first century Romans uh, wrote a lot. They recorded a lot. They had, you know, histories and biographies and uh, science books. And uh, we, we know a lot about first century Rome. It's funny when the other thing you kicked off in my head was when you're talking about peeling the onion, it almost, and the Egyptians, it's almost like, you know, today's science about the multiverse. It's almost like that, an infinite amount of layers in which almost everything could happen and has happened and will happen again. Yeah. It, it really, it's a well, it's a well thought out metaphor, I think. Yeah. And different cultures have different ideas about onions and, uh, both philosophical ideas, but also just cultural prejudices. Uh, there's a lot of cultures that look down upon people who eat raw onions, because uh, raw onions are for poor people. Or, you know, in, in uh, Cervantes, uh, Don Quixote, uh, and tells Sancho Panza to stop eating raw onions because it just shows him to be a peasant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He is a peasant. Well, that, that's why. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's lots of writing, medieval English writing about how they went to Scotland and the people were such barbarians, they ate raw onions. And the Arabs wrote about how they thought the people in Sicily and Palermo were really backwards and stupid because they ate raw onions. Um, and, and, you know, but a lot of cultures, including ours, eat raw onions. I like raw onions. Yeah, and I didn't really think about it until I realized, yeah, well, I lived in Florida for a long time and then used to go up to Valdosta and the Vidalia onion is is a very pleasant tasting thing. Right. Uh, and Bermuda onions as well. But um, that reminded me- and, You know, something. red onions, if you, you know, I like a slice of red onion on a burger. I think the oh, yeah. burger without a red onion is disappointing. <laughs> Which reminds me again of when you have the chapter about fried onions. Um, and you talked about Americans think of fried onions, they think of onion rings. And to me, onion rings with a burger or is like one of the best things in the world. But they, there's, there's some... Can you make onion rings? Because there's ways of making onion rings that are perfect, that the onion pieces break off when you bite it, or else it comes out in a long string, right. which is no good. Right. I have, uh, I think I've got five or six recipes uh, from different places, uh, different histories of uh, onion rings. Uh, <laughs> but we think of onion rings, as you say, as something very American. There's like lots of cultures that do fried onion rings. Yeah, and that's, that's one of the things that was... Um, fascinating about the chapters is because you know you go from well i want to spend some time on the soup but but like say for sauces and the first thing you say about the sauces is they're no longer in vogue and i thought okay why are they no longer in vogue and have i really ever had one so talk a little bit just for a couple seconds about onion sauces because either well, these are things i don't know most onion sauces uh, were cream sauces, and some were some were brown sauces. Um, uh, Jewish, because of kosher rules, were brown sauces and not cream sauces. But it's it's uh, it's cream that has gotten out of fashion. We don't have creamed onions anymore, which we should. I want to bring them back. And my absolute favorite food as a child. Okay. And, Odd childhood. My favorite food was vichyssoise soup. Love vichyssoise soup. I haven't seen vichyssoise for years. I don't think anybody makes it anymore. I asked my wife first how to spell it because the double S will get. It's a great bar bet because no one can spell it because of two S's. Right. Um, um, but the other thing is that it reminded me. I've interviewed uh, Kate DiCamillo a couple of times, and one of them was for the book Ratatouille. And in the movie and the book, you know, the, the harsh critic. He's overwhelmed and changes his mind completely when Ratatouille makes him the Ratatouille. And, re and it sounded so much like you because it, it reminded him of the, the smells of his childhood. Right. And then, and then that leads you to think about how much of all this is really just, and you know better than anybody because you write about all this stuff, 
is evocative, you know, like like the smell of burning leaves or something like that. A lot yeah. of it about well, the, in uh, many cultures, I would say most cultures, uh, there is a lot of food that begins by sautéing onions, and I think one of the reasons for that is that uh, the smell of sautéed onions is 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 so appetite wetting. Uh, I mean, if you just, if you're having somebody over for dinner and just saute some onions when they come in, they'll say, mm, something smells good. Um, and it's one of the great gastronomic gifts of onions is that the raw onion has this powerful statement, but onions are full of dextrose, a sugar. And when exposed to heat, their composition changes and the sweetness comes out. Uh, so it's almost like two foods, the strong food and the sweet food. And what's interesting in the book is some of the authors that you cite kind of wax poetic about the onion. Yes, yeah. people particularly wax poetic about caramelized onions, you know, which is yeah. sauteed I mean, slowly for a long time and they turn a rich golden. People go on and on about caramelized onions. Yeah, I really enjoyed reading that. And it's it's really nice, isn't it, when in older recipes they actually it's almost like uh it's almost like a prose poem in a way. Yes, I mean that's one of the reasons why I love old recipes. Around the turn of the century, around 1900, uh a totally laudable movement uh to help working women cook. Uh to simplify cooking for work because you know, cooking recipes were things you did all day at home. Now you have women who work, and and so they they made they tried to make a science out of recipe writing. You know, it was uh, Fanny Farmer was one of the ones who really started this. You know, formulaic recipes, and you follow this. You do A, then you do B, then you do C, and you'll get exactly this, uh, which is never quite true because cooking always ends up showing the personality of the person doing the cooking. But before uh, the 20th century, uh, they were much more open to that. Recipe writers were, you know, and they, they wrote in prose and they tried to convey feelings and emotions. And, and it was kind of up, for, up to you to figure out how to arrive at this. Yeah, it's funny because you, you did a couple that were like kind of middle English and you prefaced it by saying, I don't know if you're going to understand. I don't know if you'll understand this or not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you, know, you know, one of the reasons that I uh, that I love doing these old recipes is that the people who wrote them were so interesting. I mean, you get uh, politicians and you get novelists and you get uh, activists. And you do a whole history of feminism from cookbooks. I mean, so many progressive women wrote cookbooks, abolitionists and all kinds of... Um, uh, forward-thinking feminists wrote cookbooks because it was something that was open to women. Yes, uh, even funnier are the ones like tell talk about uh, Tabitha Tickletooth. Uh, well, uh, she actually wasn't a woman. But, uh, uh, it was an actor who um, dressed up sort of like a housewife, but made no effort to uh, disguise his masculinity, he just looked like a man in a dress, and uh, um, and gave uh, his fellow housewives uh, cooking advice. The other one, who was the and, one that said... You know, when, he, when he called himself Tabitha Tickletooth, which obviously wasn't his real name, you immediately know there's something going on here. <laughs> But there was another one that wasn't as obvious. Who was the one that Samuel Johnson talked about? I forgot. Hannah Glass. Hannah, Hannah Glass was a 17th century English woman who wrote fantastic recipes. I've never uh, tried a Hannah Glass recipe that wasn't great. Uh, and she was extremely popular, extremely successful. And yeah, Samuel Johnson and other people decided, you know, that it wasn't really a woman and there was no Hannah Glass. And in those days, women often didn't sign their books. So it would be uh, uh, a book 
by a lady or by an English woman or by an American woman or something. Um, but she was a real person. I have a picture of her in the book. And, yeah. and one of the interesting things for us today about Hannah Glass's books is that she wasn't particularly original. Um, so you look at her recipes and you see the kinds of things that were being done at that time. And it was at a time when English cooking was really good, uh, competitive with French cooking. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it was the Industrial Revolution that destroyed British food. When I was talking about like the prose poetry, who was the, who said, um, I'm thinking it was James Beard, but maybe not, who said uh, soup is the prologue to, to, soup is the prologue to a dinner. You had that in there somewhere. I do have that in there. It may have been James Beard. I think it might have been. But when you think about stuff, when you when someone says something like that, it almost puts you guys in the realm of philosophy or as a philosopher. And yeah. it's really interesting combining those two things, isn't it? Yes. Well, I mean, uh, you know, to thinking people, food is, is a subject worthy of a lot of reflection. And it's such a basic thing that's universal experience and yet different from person to person and from culture to culture and uh, um you know it just sort of sets you to thinking are you able like sometimes when i sit down to dinner I'm eating and I don't realize I'm eating and then I'm done and I don't realize I've finished and I realize, oh, I haven't really tasted anything. Do you ever find yourself doing that? Because essentially you're professionally not doing that. Do you ever find yourself like daydreaming while you're eating and then you're done and you haven't tasted the flavors of it? Uh, rarely. If I'm like in the throes of something I'm writing or something and really obsessing on something I might, but uh, uh, usually food sends me on a different journey mentally that has to do with what I'm eating. So let's go, let's go. Well then, okay, that leads me back to um, the onion soup because, you know, I don't know how many recipes for onion soup you have in there. But right the one that I, yeah, the one that I'm most, familiar with is the brown crock and the cheese you know you as a kid pulling the strings of cheese that went down the sides of the crock um and that's the onion soup that americans are familiar with but you talk about a lot of other ones even even the japanese tuna, toro tuna onion soup but why is onion soup so again to use the word ubiquitous what what is it a, and and again going to the soup is the prologue to a good meal um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, MFK Fisher said that soups was an infinitely variable subject. Um, there you go. You, you basically, if you, if you have a liquid, a broth or something, and you put an onion in it, you have a soup, but there's lots of different ways of doing that. Uh, and different onions. And the, 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 the famous one is the Paris version that you were talking about, the crock of the melted cheese, um, which uh, was very much a part of specifically Paris culture when, when the Leal market was going. And uh, uh, you could go out drinking all night and then you'd end up at the market and you'd have a bowl of uh, onion soup. And the myth, I think it's a myth, uh, was that... Uh, Onion soup sobers you up. Uh, the French called it soup de vron, the drunkard soup. Um, uh, Alain Sander, a great uh, uh, Paris chef, once told me that don't put cheese in the onion soup if you really want to sober up. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other one is that uh, what's, the, what's the, the story about newlywed soup? Yes, uh, an another French thing is, uh, and it's this old belief of uh, um, onions as an aphrodisiac. Uh, so, you know, have onion soup for your second night of marriage so that you'll, you know, get it back. <laughs> um, but it's sort of inevitable 
that it would be decided that onions were an aphrodisiac because onions, you know, somebody decided onions were in everything. Onions cure colds, prevent baldness. There are all these beliefs about onions. Talk about some of the varieties because you would think there'd be thousands, but you know, they're really only a score or so, correct? Uh, well, more than a score. I, I mean, first of all, there's a bunch of different wild onions. Uh, none of which are the ancestor of the cultivated onion. Interestingly, the ancestor of the cultivated onion has disappeared. And that's kind of too bad because if we had that, we could see what the onion was and what man turned it into. You know, it's like if you want to understand dogs, you got to look at wolves. Well, the wolf of the onion isn't around to examine. Um, uh, but there's uh, there are many varieties, uh, more than there used to be, because in the 20th century, they learned how to breed onions, which was a difficult thing. It was problematic because the way you normally breed plants is, uh, or anything, is is that you, you, you find males with characteristics you want and you breed them into the females. Uh, but onion is another one of the uh, strange things about onions is it's, uh, it's a self-pollinating plant. It has male parts and female parts in the same plant. Um, so it's hard to introduce a new male when it already has its own male. Um, and so what you have to find is what they call an emasculated onion, an onion that didn't have the male parts. They found one at uh, UC Davis and uh, started breeding onion varieties. And now um, a lot of the onions we eat are bread varieties. Vidalia comes from a, a bread variety, not originally, but uh, today uh, they use a, 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 a grano onion, which is a variety that was developed in Texas. The other thing I didn't realize just because I was ignorant of it was, you know, we're talking about a plant that's a beautiful plant too. And yes, it's a, it's a flowering plant in, in Holland, where, you know, the, 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 there's really an industry of selling ornamental plants. They sell 40 different types of onion, flowering onion plants for, for ornamentation. You got to make a choice here. Um, if you want to have flowers, the bulb isn't going to be worth much because everything in the bulb goes into producing the flower. So after once it flowers, the bulb really isn't worth eating. Uh, which is why, you know, you rarely see flowered onions except for people who grow them in their gardens for decoration because, um, you know, the name of the game is to, to pull it before it flowers. Yeah, it's, um, I guess that's true of um, other plants. Are there any other edible plants that once they flower? Yeah, uh, um, herbs like uh, basil. Right. Yeah. Well, so what happens with, um, you know, what happens when you delve into these older recipes, whether it's for cod or the original uses for salt or salmon or whatever, you, you branch off into things that I would have never thought of, like um, onion pudding, onion custard, onion cake. And there's all varying recipes about that. Yeah. And you, you, Are you, any... you have to keep in mind that desserts are a fairly modern idea. And that originally these things like puddings and, and, and cakes and, and pies were savory dishes. They, they weren't sweet dessert dishes. Um, now there have been some desserts made with onions. Um, they're very big on this in Georgia. I actually recently in Atlanta had an excellent uh, onion chest pie that was sweet. Um, but uh, a lot of the recipes that I have, these older recipes for onion cakes and things, are, these aren't sweet dishes. Yeah, it's um, the other thing that when you mentioned savory um, is the egg, you know, when it, that's when my mouth was kind of watering was like what, a good egg and onion sandwich um, is really, really good if you have the right onion and the right bread. Right, right. My favorite uh, sandwich in the book is James Beard's sandwich for uh, oat bread, butter the bread, 
put in sardines and a slice of raw onion. And that is a wonderful sandwich. Far, oh, better, than, far better than Hemingway's uh, raw onion and peanut butter sandwich. I'm still going to do that. <laughs> uh, you, you just talked, James Beard's favorite sandwiches is the same as my father's was, except he would swap out anchovies, which I actually like better, but, you know, teach his own. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, James Beard loved raw onions. He has lots of, several raw onion sandwiches, and lots of raw onion recipes. When, when you, when you, uh, how do you, ch I mean, it's like I said at the introduction, these things, staples isn't really the right word, but they are things that salt is, salt and paper are two perfect examples. So you've got, you know, like 30 of these different books under your belt, but a lot of them are completely different, like fly fishing. But when you think of a staple like that, something that's everywhere, and what is it that gives you this impetus to say, you know what, I'm going to, because you really have to do a lot of research to do this. Yeah, I mean, it's not always uh, uh, for the same reason. I mean, with onions, it, it, it was it was it was very much that I thought onions weren't given their due. <laughs> you know, that everybody has onions around and nobody was appreciating what an unusual thing they were. Um, uh, with uh, Cod, it was a history that led to the uh, deterioration of, of fishing. It was really uh, an environmental book. My salmon book is really an environmental book. My oyster book is, is about urban pollution. Um, so in, in a lot of cases, it's, it's that. I, I'm doing a book on uh, lobsters that I've just started, and, and that's very much a book about climate change. Uh, I mean, it's also, it's a book about climate change with recipes. <laughs> yeah, my brother goes lobstering in the Keys. And then this summer, he said, the water in the Keys was as hot as a hot tub. And I don't know what that is doing. Well, I do know exactly what that's doing. You got the hottest year on record and two days last year, this year that were above the two degree. Anyway, be yeah. That as it may. The, the Gulf the Gulf of Maine, which is one of the largest uh, uh, lobster beds in the world, uh, it's not just the state of Maine, but the Gulf of Maine, which goes from Massachusetts up to Canada, is one of the fastest warming parts of the ocean uh, with a huge impact on the life there. Well, getting off of a morbid, morbid subject. When I was, the, one of the, the other things that happens when you read your books is like, and I think you even, I think you talk about this or maybe it was in one of the reviews, but so like, like last night when we were having dinner and we have a little lazy Susan in the middle and it has, you know, truffle stuff and salt and pepper and a little blade to shave the Himalayan salt that my wife gets. But I'm looking at the salt and pepper and like in the book, I'm thinking, okay, why is this, why is this always here? <laughs> You know, I never really thought about it. Why is why are these two things here on every table, and and used to be on every table in restaurants, but are never on tables in restaurants anymore? Well, in in Asia, in China, and Japan, uh, they were uh, pepper, yes, but salt was never on the table. It was up to the chef to determine how salty a dish would be, which which I, I think is which I think is right actually. Yeah, he wouldn't have. Yeah, he salted it. He doesn't eat. My wife's the same way. She said, why are you putting? And they, there's that story about Thomas Edison. And if he was going to hire someone, he would take him to lunch. And if he put salt in his soup before he took a taste of it, he wouldn't hire him. Yeah, only one of many strange things about Edison. <laughs> yeah, if, it, if they're true. But yeah, it's, um, yeah, there really isn't any reason to do anything to your food if, if a chef has prepared it for you. Right. Um, yeah, so salt and pepper. Oh, I know what my brother did. My brother and my son went to Japan and they went to a sushi restaurant and Bob asked the chef for, could he have some more wasabi? Go, oh, why would you say that? And I think they almost kicked him out. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he just, he loves wasabi and ginger. <laughs> he could just eat that. Um, What's it? Okay, so the next one is uh, lobsters. You're writing lobsters now. 
Yeah, it's actually not the next one. In between onions and lobsters, I have abolitionists. <laughs> Uh, I'm finishing up a book on Boston abolitionists who were dedicated to nonviolence and determined to emancipate slaves, to end slavery without violence, to prevent a civil war, because they believed that if you ended it with violence, um, that it would take, they said, 100 years. It turns out more than 100 years for Black people to get their rights. You know? Yeah. A, a, a court just seriously impinged voting the Voting Rights Act just yesterday. I know. I saw. You know, all this stuff these people thought could be ended with slavery if you could convince people to end slavery rather than forcing them through violence. But well, the, the Civil War would not get the result you needed. Well, look, we live in a world now that you can't get to that point because there is no civil discourse. In absence of civil discourse, there's no way to reach a solution to any problem. And that's exactly where we are now. Well, well this book is one of a number of books I've written about nonviolence. It's sort of a lifelong thing. I was a Vietnam War resistor, and um, it's never easy. It's, just, it's never something that a large number of people will... Uh, except that there is there is something in us that makes us think although all history contradicts this that war and violence will solve problems well yeah look at today you have two going that when when israel started everyone forgot about ukraine and and you can't even imagine well you never can imagine in war when you're not in it what must be happening to the people if you did you wouldn't be able to live because the pain you felt would be so visceral Right. But so what do you say? Okay, well, we're veering off of everything. But so when you write a book like that, I mean, when you write the food books, I know what you're expecting the reader to take away from it. It's, you know, it's enjoyment, it's entertainment, it's a search for knowledge. It's the idea that after he leaves the book, he or she leaves the book, they're going to experiment with your recipes, which I will be doing. Um, but when you write a book like The Abolitionist One or other book about books about nonviolence, um, and your aspirations for what the human race actually should be. What are you expecting of the, Are you expecting a, a seed change in civilization because of what you're writing? Are you expecting a reaction that will help? Anybody who's been a writer as long as I have knows that writers don't really change the world. <laughs> uh, just maybe a little bit. I, I once got a, um, a letter from somebody. I wrote a book on the history of nonviolence and I got a letter from a soldier who said he wasn't re-upping, he was getting out of the military after reading my book. And, you know, responses like that are extraordinary, but not, not at all usual. My, my book about the Boston abolitionists, which is basically um, a book that argues against the Civil War, um, I hope that people will read it and start thinking about other wars. And if, if war is ever the solution, you know, well, all you do is hope you get people thinking a little about these things. Just that one person thing does make a difference. I know I have that experience in the bookstore and I've told this story before, but like a couple, two things. One, like if you if you climb up on my library ladder and you're looking for a specific book, this won't happen in Amazon. Not that Amazon's fine. But if you're climbing up my ladder and you're looking for a specific book, you also see the book on either side. And it's one of those books might very well change the whole course of your life. And the other one is this kid who's like 12 years old and uh, he brought up war and peace. And there was no way I could charge him for it. You know, I was thinking, you know, there's no way I can make him. So I, I, got I, was, left I was I was that kid. I, I, I wanted to exhaust writers. I read everything Hemingway wrote. I read everything Steinbeck wrote, and then yeah. Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. <laughs> I took the, Evelyn, you remember the Evelyn Wood speed reading course? Yes. I took it and I read Steinbeck's The Pearl in 17 minutes with 85% comprehension. <laughs> I still remember the whole book and also Sink the Bismarck. That's sort of like, you know, that's sort of like uh, removing the sting from onions, you know? It, it's just... <laughs> Exactly. It just you don't really want all experience. You don't really want eighty-five percent comprehension, <laughs> right? 
but I read it, I read it again. And and now even like whatever it is, 50 years later, I still find myself in that I don't do that swooping motion across the page, but I do find that I my speed did increase because of Evelyn Wood. If she in fact existed as well, if there was a real Evelyn Wood, I don't know. Well, I'll tell you, I um uh, I don't think I took Evelyn Wood, but I did at one point when I was about 14, take a speed reading course of some kind. And it stayed with me. But what it is, is that I read a lot of academic books for research. And, you know, every once in a while, you get an E.O. Wilson who writes beautiful prose. But a lot of it, you know, I'm just trying to get the information. And I use those speed reading techniques. Right. I do that, too. And it's surprising since, you know, this is like I'm over a thousand interviews. If there is a book that is either inaccessible to me or too dense or I'm too dumb to read it, I find that I can still speak intelligently about it and and am surprised in the conversation how much of the book I remember. But in yours, it's so much easier because you like it so much that you're not going to forget it. Well, so I, my hope is that people have a good time when they read my books. Oh yeah, it's it it is. It's it's uh, you got you got to be the right person, but the kind of person you are is the only kind of person I know. <laughs> and, you know, the people who come into the bookstore are people I like and who believe in nonviolence. But <laughs> it's just yeah, inside. right, it's like I go on these book tours all over the country, and I see an America that is very enlightened and very progressive. <laughs> uh, you know, because I mean. Angry right wingers don't come to my readings. <laughs> there may be some Midwestern mom who's quite entranced with the Onion book. You need to put some subliminal messages in those books. Well, you did. You got plenty of the elder in there and plenty of the junior. You got both plenties. <laughs> <laughs> can't go wrong with that. <laughs> well, that's, I guess that's a good way to end it. You know, you, you can't go wrong anything uh, an interview talking about plenty of the elder. No one knows. Makes you sound smart. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the book, and thank you so much for all the books and the fact that you're continuing to do it. And hopefully, I can talk to you next time. Well, thank you for selling it. Pleasure talking to you. Likewise. So long. Bye bye.